Chuck, thanks for leading us in prayer. Good morning, LCPC. My name is Jeff. I'm the senior pastor of this church and so glad to be with you as always in worship. Worship grounds us in who God is and what God has done in Jesus. I need that. I think all of us need that so that we can be sent out into the world, into what we've been calling the public square. When I say that, I mean several things. I do mean the marketplace, so how we spend our money, how we save our money, how we give our money. Really, any part of our organized life would be another side of the public square, wherever people are concerned, any civil role we have in our lives. Also, our receiving and participation in media, both mainstream media, um, social media is a big part of the public square. And another side of this square is what we would call politics, both in the big sense of politics is whenever people are organized and how power is shared, how relationships are structured. So probably at your work, there are office politics as power is shared. Even at a church, there is politics in that larger sense as we try and organize ourselves and share power and resources, all of that. But also in that narrower sense of politics, that's what we're also considering is Republicans and Democrats and voting and candidates and bills and Congress. What is our role as followers of Jesus to step into that part of the public square. Remember a couple of commitments I have. I shared these with you last week. I'll just very quickly remind you. I will not at any time in this ser- series tell you how to vote or be partisan. I'm not interested in doing either of those things. I'm interested in us asking what does it mean to follow Jesus out in the world. So what I hope for, these are the goals of the series, I hope we'll be more united rather than divided. I hope that we would practice the gift of civility. We have to learn what it is, but it's not good enough just to have a a mental understanding of civility from a Christian perspective. We need to actually practice that. That's why Rich Mao, this coming Tuesday, 645, is going to be so good. He's an expert on what he calls convicted civility, which is holding on to your convictions with one hand while with the other hand being open to who the other person is, their beliefs, their opinions, and rich in a really beautiful way as practice that throughout his life. So that's going to be a wonderful night. But I want all of us to have a chance to learn about civility and to practice it. That's a big part of what I'm going to be talking about this morning as we look at Paul's letter to the church in Galatia and what he calls the fruit of of the Spirit. Finally, I want to provide a frame for what it means to live in the public square, including that relationship between faith and politics. What is that all about from a Jesus perspective. That's what we are trying to do. And this morning we turn to a profound passage from Paul's letter to the churches in Galatia. And the fruit of the Spirit part might be familiar to you. I'm going to read the whole passage, though, to give us some context. So will you pray with me? Let's ask the Lord to speak as we turn to his word. So, Lord Jesus, here we are. We are your church. Jesus, you are on the throne. You and you alone are king of this world, of our lives, of this church. You are Lord because you've been raised from the dead, so we submit to you. Holy Spirit, we believe you are the one who makes these words holy, and we believe you also can make our lives holy. You can transform us, and we actually long for you to do that, and we submit to you, Holy Spirit, to transform us. We pray even in this reading of Scripture and considering of your word that you would do just that. Lord, we are your servants and we are listening. We pray in the name of Christ. Amen. So church, this is God's word for us, for you. I believe God has something to say to you through these words of Scripture this morning. Paul writes, Live by the Spirit, I say, And do not gratify the desires of the flesh. For what the flesh desires is opposed to the spirit. And what the spirit desires is opposed to the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to prevent you from doing what you want. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not subject to the law. Now, says Paul, the works of the flesh are obvious. Fornication, impurity, licentiousness, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy, 
drunkenness, carousing. This is quite a list that Paul gives. He's about to get to the good part about the fruit of the Spirit. That's the part we put on our coffee mugs, right? We don't put that first verse on our coffee mugs. Verse 21, Paul continues. All of these I am warning you against. As I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. By contrast, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such thing there is no law. And those who belong to Christ, verse 24, belong to Christ Jesus and have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires, if we live by the Spirit, let us also be guided by the Spirit. And Lord, that's what we want. We want to be guided by you, Holy Spirit. So bless to us, we pray, Lord, this reading and hearing of your word. Amen. It's my conviction that our faith is necessarily an outward, outdoors kind of faith. I think that's Paul's conviction too. You hear it in this passage. Certainly if you read the whole of this letter to the churches in Galatia, Paul is convinced that our inward faith must be lived outwardly. Paul's convicted of that and speaks of the life in the Spirit. We are to walk in the life of the Spirit. Our inward faith must be expressed outwardly. Our faith is to be lived on the front porch. I love front porches. Don't you think something has been lost that front porches are no longer common? The first house I bought with my wife, Heather, we were living in Kansas City. She was in med school. I was a private school teacher. We had very little money. We bought this house, the whole thing, not the down payment, the whole thing for $70,000. <laughs> totally different part of the country. This wasn't that long ago. But it's this cute little bungalow in Kansas City, Kansas, had a porch about twice the size of this little section of the stage on which I'm now standing. And just three yards that way was our neighbor, Josh, who also had a porch. We were always outside on our porch with our dog, Ralphie. Go Buffs. They lost. That's all right. I'm sure they're going to win again. By the way, welcome back to the Lloyds. Aren't you glad that Aaron and Kristen are back with us in worship? We're so glad you're here. And... Uh, both of them love getting singled out like that. So anyway, I'm um, glad both of you are here and your family. But anyway, so Josh had his porch over here. We were always out on our front porch. And necessarily, we got to know our neighbor because he was right there, yards away. And something's lost when that crucial piece of architecture has gone away from our lives. I want you to hear from one of our outreach partners, and his name is Sean Whiting, about his experience on the front porch in West Philadelphia. So let's watch Sean's experience. Hi, La Cunada Prez. Welcome to West Philadelphia and the porch life that we Whitings experience on Pine Street here in Philadelphia. It's such a pleasure to partake in the uh, Faith in the Public Square series. Um, and I just wanted to share a little bit about our life here in West Philly. When we came back from India, which we continue to work for, of course, and LCPC is such a wonderful partner, thank you so much. But when we came back from India in 2016, we wanted to have a place where we could tangibly love our neighbor, not just kind of in a metaphorical way, although Jesus meant it like that, but also just very, very literally um, embody what it meant to really love your neighbors and reach out. And when we saw, um, life in kind of an urban center here, like in Philly, where we've got porches and where our neighbors are literally feet from where we spend a lot of our time. We thought this is a perfect place to be able to live and kind of live out what Jesus wants from his followers. So take a look at our porch, take a look at our friends. And of course there's Jaya with our friend Rachel and then our friend Journey. Hi Journey. And then Rain, of course, and our other daughter, Eden, is right down there playing. So it's unanimous. Everybody loves to be here on a porch and build community. That's our contribution um, to what community life is like here in Philly and a little window for LCPC. We love you guys. Thanks so much. 
So I think that's really cool. I mean, for one, Sean and Paige are doing amazing things in India with our partner Covenant Children's Home. But they could have, you know, they direct it from here in the United States. They could have chosen to live anywhere, but they chose that spot for a specific reason. And a big part of it has to do with that front porch kind of life. That, I think, according to Scripture, especially this passage, that's what we're called to, is life on the front porch. It's not just an inward faith, but somehow, some way, an outward, public, on the front porch kind of faith. So what does that mean? What should our posture be on the front porch? What should our habits be on the front porch? How then shall we live? To ask that question, which is asked in Francis Schaeffer's book by that question or by that title, this is what this passage of Scripture is all about. And first, before, of course, it's about living by the fruit of the Spirit. But before we get to that, we have to address this harder part that Paul warns us about the life of the flesh. We are freed from the life of the, fre- of the flesh and set free toward the life of the Spirit. So Paul, Paul first lists all of those Um, parts of the life of the flesh. The life of the flesh, the Greek word, by the way, there is sarx. Really what it means is living an as-if life. Living our lives as if there is not a God. Or more specifically, living our lives as if there is not the God revealed in Jesus Christ, who himself lived in the flesh, not meaning that this was his life. In fact, Hebrews, the letter there tells us Jesus in every way was tempted just as we are, yet was without sin. But Jesus took on this fleshly embodied life so as to redeem it. And when we live a life as if the God revealed in Jesus Christ does not exist, is not real, we are enslaved by the flesh. That's what the flesh does. It enslaves us. It eventually will control us. If we live as if this God revealed in Jesus Christ doesn't exist, I don't know which of these on the list is, is true for you or, or marks your life, but I know you're human. So in some way, this list, these acts of the flesh describe your life. And in some way, you're enslaved, controlled by those desires of the flesh. You see, our culture, the world around us, would tell us that actually to live in the flesh is to be set free, but that's a lie. You actually will be controlled by these desires and these acts of the flesh. What we need is a savior to set us free from the flesh. Paul says in another letter, the law of the spirit of life has set me free from the law of sin and death. We've been set free to these things that we're held in bondage to, these acts of the flesh. In particular, just look at the list that's up on the screen. This is at the heart of the list that Paul shares with these churches in Galatia. Enmity, strife, jealousy, anger, quarrels, dissensions, factions, envy. That probably was at the heart of what these churches were really struggling with. They were fighting. There was a lot of disagreement, a lot of theological disagreement. But as you look at that list, does that not also describe much of what we encounter, see, experience in the public square, particularly in this current cultural moment in which we're in, particularly in this really important corner of the public square we call the media, both the mainstream media, news media, and also social media. When things go south, say on Facebook, and every once in a while that happens, does this list not describe what happens when people start fighting and bickering And really, it doesn't help or bless anyone. Some of you pick fights on Facebook. How is that going for you? And does it really work? Does it really help? By the way, we've learned how to do that, I think. And by the way, of course, a lot good comes from Facebook, like cute pictures of children and dogs. That really helps the world. But the negative part of it, we've learned, I think, from the mainstream media, from the news media. And again, a lot of good comes from mainstream news media. One of the the cornerstones of our public square is freedom of the press, and we need it. We need objective, unbiased reporting of what's going on in the world. But this list also actually works really well. No matter how you spell the news, CNN, FOX, NBC, that list is really, that's how they make their money. 
They love it that there's dissensions and factions and bickering and arguing. It's not just sex that sells. It's all the works of the flesh that sell. And these organizations, they have a bottom line and they're concerned about ratings. And so we can get pulled into that. And we as followers of Jesus, we've got to be aware as we engage with media, both social and mainstream media, how we're engaging, how we're stepping in to the public square. And are we letting this consume us and influence us and shape how we ourselves are in the public square? Because we too can be controlled by it. This is what happens with the works of the flesh. Let me just ask you a question. I think this is a convicting question, by the way, I would never ask a convicting question of you that I'm not already asking of myself, but are you, or of myself, are you spending more time with your favorite cable news ideologue or anchor than you are with King Jesus? If you are, then you have no or little chance of living out this life of the spirit, of being in the, the public square in that Jesus-shaped kind of way. Let me ask a question that Pastor Cindy asked us a couple weeks ago. I think it's so good. I keep thinking about and praying about it. How are you facing Jesus? Because as we face Jesus, as he's our primary image, we're transformed by him. That's why we need to read scripture. That's why we need to pray. That's why we need to be in worship. That's why we think life groups are important to share your life, your real life with other followers of Jesus. That's why we think a weekend at a silent retreat could be a really good way of facing Jesus. Or a weekend with, man, with men for the men's retreat in about a month, with women for the women's retreat in a couple months. A lot of what we do as our life as a church is opportunities to face Jesus. Are you doing that or are you facing more often than you're doing that your favorite anchor? Your life can't be anchored in a news anchor. It won't work. That anchor will not hold. I was pretty proud of that line, by the way, in my sermon. <laughs> it's only Jesus who will hold. So are you facing him? Are you spending time with him? That's how his ways become our ways. That's how we can be on the, the front porch in the way he would want us to be. That's how we can live the life of the spirit that Paul calls us to in this passage. Notice this list when Paul does get to the fruit of the Spirit. He had said that the, the works of the flesh are, meaning that they're, they're separate, they're varied. But then when he gets to the life of the Spirit, he says, the fruit of the Spirit is, meaning it's all one thing. Love, joy, peace, pain, decisions, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. It's all part of one gift. It all runs together because as soon as we're in Christ Jesus, as soon as we've said yes to Jesus, started to follow him, we receive the, the gift of the Spirit and we receive the fruit of the Spirit. We don't have to ask for it. And really, we can't even make ourselves be more loving, more joyful. We try more peaceful, more patient. You've tried that one before. It doesn't, it doesn't work. I need patience. And you try and will yourself to do it and you can't. You're trying in the wrong way. You need to receive the gift and it all comes together. It's already in you, church, if the Spirit of Christ is in you. The question is, will you leave it, live it out? Will you receive it? Will you let that be expressed in your life? That's how the, the fruit of the Spirit works. Really, the fruit of the Spirit are all about what we would call civility, Christian civility. And again, that's a big one of my goals for this series. We learn about it, practice it. The word civility comes from the word civil, which in turn comes from the Latin word for city, which is civitas. Really, to be Civil or to practice civility in a Jesus-shaped way just means that we are squarely planting ourselves in the city of God, the new Jerusalem. That is our primary city, no matter if you live in La Crescenta or Glendale or Pasadena or Eagle Rock or Altadena or La Cunata or wherever it is that you live, your primary zip code is the city of God. Paul, in another letter to the church in Philippi, says this, but our citizenship is in heaven and it is from there that we are expecting a savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Augustine, the great theologian of the fifth century, said it this way, we have learned that there is a city of God 
And we have longed to become citizens of that city with a love inspired by its founder. Do you know of this city of God? That is your primary residence, this new Jerusalem. That's what God's doing in the world. And we're meant to live out the virtues, the civility of that particular city. And that kind of civility can change the world. And I think our world right now is desperate for it. It's a civility shaped by King Jesus who died for our sins, died for our flesh on the cross. It's to him that we belong. Listen to how Paul says it at the end of this passage, verse 24. And those who belong, and that's a really important word to us at LCPC, it's the first part of our discipleship model. Belong, serve, grow. We think that's the first step of faith is to belong to Jesus and to belong to a community. Those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. The fruit of the Spirit is not the fruit of just any spirit. It's the fruit of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, the Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead, who raised the crucified Jesus from the dead. We belong to that Savior, and that should describe and it should set up a unique kind of civility that those around us are desperate for and can be transformed by as we belong to that crucified Jesus, because that calls us to belong to each other. And here I think is really the key. It calls us to belong to the other, the one who is different than we are, who looks different, acts differently, has a different experience. The one for whom when they take the census later this year and we take it, we're going to be checking all kinds of different boxes. We're called to those who are different than us. That's what the fruit of the Spirit are for, is that kind of shared life with the other. A few weeks ago, the Cowboys were playing the Packers, and the camera caught these two on screen. And I love this picture. I don't know what those two were laughing about, what they were talking about. I do know that uh, Ellen has the iPhone 11 Plus, which um, <laughs> that's important. So, but of course, you know, when this happened, Twitter erupted. And by the way, I don't get that. When I watch football this afternoon, I'm going to set my phone aside and, you know, not be on Twitter. Some people are like live tweeting through the game. And of course, these two, they're on opposite sides of the public square. George W. Bush over here with everything he stands for in his presidency and Ellen DeGeneres over here, polar opposites, laughing, smiling, talking. And Ellen caught a lot of heat, particularly on Twitter, like, how dare you? Don't you know what he stands for and what his presidency was all about? And probably President Bush, too. Like, don't you know who she is and how she lives her life? Ellen, a couple days later on her, her show, and by the way, look it up, um, just Google it, Ellen DeGeneres and George Bush, and watch her entire monologue. But this is what she had to say at the end of her monologue. When I say be kind to one another, I don't mean only the people who think the same way that you do. I mean be kind to everyone. Amen. <laughs> amen. I say amen because that is truth. And all truth, I think, is God's truth. And that's the gospel truth, to be kind to everyone. That's at the heart of civility. We're called to those who are different than we are. And we don't need a luxury suite at Dallas Stadium. All that's needed is a cup of coffee and reaching out to someone and listening and empathy. That's all that's required to be called to the other. Just a couple questions for you based on this passage, based on this call from Scripture to leave behind the works of the flesh, to step into the life of the Spirit. Again, that's not willing ourselves. That's just receiving the gift and letting it flow into our lives and come out of us. First of all, are you facing Jesus? If you're not, you have no hope of living out the life of the Spirit. Facing Jesus is how we receive the gift of the fruit of the Spirit through reading Scripture, through prayer, through worship, through community with sisters and brothers in Christ. Are you facing Jesus? And secondly, what other is God calling you to? Meaning what person who is different than you are? 
Maybe they look differently, different experience. They're going to vote differently in upcoming elections. I deeply believe we're called to those others. This is the way Jesus put it in the Sermon on the Mount, this convicting word. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers and sisters, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same. The fruit of the Spirit is God's gift to us, not just to live with people who are exactly the same as us, but more than that, to live in community with the other. That is what God calls us to. That's how God wants us to inhabit the front porches of our lives. Ray Bradbury wrote this book called Fahrenheit 451. He wrote it, by the way, about 20 minutes from here in the basement of the USC library. Just locked himself away for a couple days, typed away on a typewriter, wrote this dystopian novel about this future in which there's no books. In fact, the firefighters, they don't put out fires, they start fires, they burn the books. And of course, what was lost with books was the free exchange of ideas. What was lost also was diversity of beliefs and experience. What was lost really was the beauty of the other, those who are different than us and how that can transform us and shape us and we can grow in compassion and generosity and empathy. You know, also did not exist in the world of Fahrenheit 451 was front porches. They were no longer needed. The architects had ruled them out because if you don't have books, you don't have ideas, you don't have ideas, you don't need conversation. You don't need time to think and just be and laugh and sit in silence. May that world never be our world. And may the church be those who at our best step onto the front porch and live out our faith in a gracious, civil, meaning marked by the city of God, whose king is Jesus, who died on the cross, kind of way. Church, we're called to the other. That's what the kingdom of God is all about. So let's hear that call and receive it. Church, will you pray with me? So Jesus, you are king, and we do claim with faith what we read in the scriptures and what are affirmed in our creeds that you died for us on the third day. You were raised from the dead. Lord, it's for this reason that we call you king. And we would be citizens of your city, the new Jerusalem, the heavenly city. And we would be marked by the civility of that city in which we give ourselves to others, particularly those who are different than us, who think differently, who have different experiences. Lord, as hard as that is, and it is hard, call us to that and give us courage, Lord, to receive others, to be in conversation. Lord, we'll do that for your kingdom, for your city, for your glory, because we are led by your Holy Spirit.